You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts. And today we have a really cool guest, don't we? Yeah, Thomas, uh, CC McCotter is uh, just an ambassador for everything outdoors, uh, woods mm-hmm. and waters. Um, and he's been at it a long time. I'm anxious to hear how long he has been at it. Um, and so uh, we've had a good working relationship uh, together um, through the Richmond show. And he's come up uh, to Jake's and, and helped us with different seminars and, and things of that nature. Um, and so looking forward to hearing his knowledge, uh, yeah, specifically on, on the water. Uh, so, uh, Mr. McCotter, if you maybe want to just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are and uh, how long you've been doing this and maybe lead into, uh, woods and waters. You bet. Hey, first of all, let me thank you, Tom and Jared for inviting me to participate in this show, this broadcast, the fishing, the DMV great idea and um again it's an honor and a pleasure to speak to you and your listeners so thank you for that um and calling me an ambassador for all the outdoors it's that's awful i appreciate that we uh we have a passion for everything that we do and we chose to do what we do and we we do it based upon that passion woods and waters is one of them woods and waters publishing um just a brief story on that that publication was started back in 1987 by Tony Faith and they hired me in uh, 92, 91, late 91, early 92, and uh, fresh out of college in that time, um, it was a recession, so there weren't a whole lot of jobs, and I wasn't recruited highly, it was, you know, that, a newspaper, in fact, I worked in the newspaper right out of college, and then they were recruiting me to come work for Woods and Waters, they were they were getting aged and they they wanted to see where the magazine could, could go with with maybe some new blood and i was like this is exactly what i've always wanted to do i wanted to be an outdoor publisher and i was already already starting to do that with the paper we were we we're starting to build an outdoor section which was very popular in louisa county which is one of the counties here at lake anna and uh went to work for, for tony and faith a mom and pop publishing company uh, worked for them for eight years made my way from down here up there to associate editor which basically does everything you just you know don't make any money which for everybody out there slogging along and uh, jobs where you don't think you're ever going to make any money you know wise man once told me if you stick with something for a long long time you will be associated with that particular thing and people will come to you for that thing so eight years later in 2000 or thereabouts we bought the magazine from tony and faith that would be my wife and I, Chrissy. And, you know, at that point, all those ideas that I've been holding, you know, t- close to the vest, we, we did, we expanded the magazine, we did tie charge, we changed the look of it, the regional focus reports became, became a little bit different. Um, we set up a Woods and Waters Pro Team, where we have all kinds of notable influencers that, that write articles for us, uh, bucket list <clears throat> articles about places we go. Um, uh, let's see what else we do. We do a destination file. We, we pick an interesting area and we just go there. We've been to the Thousand Islands. Uh, one of our pro staffers have hunted elk. And really, there's countless places here in Virginia that um, we'll never run out of, which uh, you know, we've done Mumo. I mean, you name it. We've done it. Bugs Island, Gaston, Lake Anna, Smith Mountain, James River, Rappahannock River. It's really a great place to be here in Virginia because you, you'll never run out of interesting places to write about. So that, that's Woods and Waters. Woods and Waters will celebrate 35 years of publishing uh, this July. That's great. Wow. I mean, you're doing a great job with it. I know I use it as a resource. Um, the regional reports, if we're fishing, you know, different body of water, you know, for different club tournaments or youth, uh, I'm always, you know, reading through the information. And there are times, you know, I was telling them I'm on the lake and, you know, I'm struggling to get a bite. And I'll say, you know, you talked about throwing a jerk bait on points, you know, so mm-hmm. I whip that out and sure enough, there's a fish. So um so it, it is it is a great resource you're a very good writer yourself and as, you know editor you do a very good job with the Shenandoah valley so thank you for doing that i appreciate that my english high school 10th grade english teacher probably would have thought differently uh <laughs> as she would always mark up my essays little, and such but very little editing 
So I, I have a question. So let's say if you want an article to go out on, on, on spring fishing, a certain place, what is your, what is, when you're sitting down in the room, what is the space of time for when you, you get some, one of your pro staff out in the water, write the article and, and publish, publish it? How far in advance does, does all that work? Cause I, I don't think for the listeners at home truly appreciate the amount of work and logistics that go into an article being mm-hmm. written in here. Well, I think you'd be surprised because sometimes there's a small window of opportunity because, you know, these people that are staff and um, pro team members, they all have jobs and responsibilities that call them to do things other than write articles, you know, <laughs> in advance. So sometimes the articles are written months in advance. Dr. Peter Brooks, for example, he um, he, he actually does uh, some, I guess you would call punditry for Fox News, but he, he likes to write and he travels a bit. So he'll write an article for us from time to time. And at the beginning of the year, we'll talk a grocery list of articles, laundry list, whatever you want to call it. And I'll, he'll say, what about these? He'll pitch article ideas. And then I'll say, well, I've got a couple of, um, you know, marketing partners that would like somebody like yourself to come down and, and stay with them and write an article. on. So in that case, Tom, the articles are written uh, in advance, but, you know, not always, because let's say he wants to do a goose hunt and, you know, that, that's going to take place in December and, you know, you got to run it, run it in the January edition. So there, there's, there's a quick turnaround. Okay. And some of the stuff, like maybe a wounded warrior article, wounded warrior article, he could do that and we could run it later in the year. So that, that varies. So sometimes it's, um, it's quick. Sometimes it's within a week. We, we have, we are very nimble with our deadlines and sometimes it's months. So it varies. Probably not the, the question you want to know, but it, just to let you know, it takes about 10 days from start to finish. When, when we sit down in the production studio, it takes 10 days to get the puzzle of an edition put together. That's super quick. That's impressive. Well, you know, you want really to be cool. for a while. And as long as everybody hits their deadlines and Jared knows all about that, that's right. we're good. So, uh, of course, this is what we're talking about, if those that don't don't know. Um, and I do want to kind of touch on here, the Susquehanna River uh, has an article, and I, I was kind of reading through it a little bit there before we started. Uh, in November, I believe, you were fishing the Susquehanna. Do you want to can you talk a little bit to that uh, strong smallmouth fishery? Yeah, I, I was on my bucket list. We were supposed to go last year and something came up and it, during like the week of the trip that was planned, I had to I had to bail, which I felt terrible about because it was a trip that was set up by an interstate battery marketing partner. And, you know, he'd set it up with pretty much the number one guide service on the Susquehanna River. Real, I think it's called Real Real River Adventures, Chris Gorsuch, mm-hmm. we're fishing associates. And these guys are incredibly equipped they have these very specific jet boats which i detail in the magazine in fact there's a picture of it. they're not like nothing i've ever seen before with trolling motors with you know i pilot that will hold you right on the spot in the strong current we're just on the river at 45 miles an hour because these things are 200 horsepower inboard jets without a care in water that's you know six inches deep i'm looking down and looking at you know i'm counting rocks <laughs> on that's the crazy. and uh you know just putting all my, my trust in this guy who's run the river and, and we never hit a thing. And we did hit a few smallmouth though. We, um, we started out a little slow cause the river, I think um, at where we put in, it was called Liverpool. Maybe some of your, your readers mm-hmm. might want Liverpool. Um, the river was high. I think it was 10 point something, which is maybe three feet high. But what that does is once you figure out the pattern, it really concentrates fish in specific areas. And his the head guide was also in the water. And through through the magic of cell phone technology, we figured out a pattern very quickly. Um, and by about eleven, we were catching fish on every stop. And you know, I've, I've caught five times. I've seen six pound smallmouth come to my boat on the St. Lawrence Seaway, and many five pounders. So I, I know how to quantify a fish, and we caught some beautiful fish. Um, right up to around 20, 20 inches, I guess, 19 and something. And I saw one much bigger than that come up in shark allure. So my bucket list was checked. It was an amazing trip. Thanks to Interstate Batteries and Real River Adventures or Real River Fishing and just an amazing fisher. I encourage everybody to maybe check out that article and, you know, retrace the steps there. That's what the bucket list is about. Mm-hmm. You know, get everybody enthused and inspired to, to go after their bucket list. 
That's right. That's exactly right. Woods and Water is really what inspired me to do th this podcast because I remember uh, reading an article about Lake Mumaw and I was like, where the heck is this place? Um, and just to see like what a, an amazing fishery that was and that nobody talks about that. And, and, and you touched on it a, a, before the, uh, we started the podcast episode. There are so many cool places in Virginia to fish. How do you, um, running this magazine, know where to send somebody? Do you wait for like uh, hot reports on this certain body of water? Or you like, hey, we should send somebody there because there's so many to pick from. So how, how do you, in your position, choose wh where to go and what to highlight? Long time ago, I had a bachelor party at Lake Mumo. In fact, before I was even married, <laughs> Lake Mumo. And, uh, you know, my bachelor party was a, one night in a cabin and one night camping at uh, Lake Mumo. And uh, it's a great time. Caught a lot of fish and just had good fellowship with some some good friends. But Lake Mumo was always um, kind of like the forgotten fishery of Lake Hannah, just like you said, Tom. They get no press. <laughs> when you go up there, nothing's changed for 30 years. I hadn't been there in about 20 years when we went back. And all the tackle shops had closed. Um, you know, there's very little change up there at all. Um, it's just, it's so far off the beaten path. The, the reason why it became um, relevant again, I guess, is because there was a fellow by the name of David Bryant, who's on our pro team, who lives in Covington. He works with a paper mill there. And he was, he was putting up some astounding catches uh, on his social media site. And I reached out to him and, and we just kind of, struck up a, a social media friendship and it just blossomed from there. I, I contacted the chamber of commerce, which I think is called Highland, the Highland County chamber of commerce or something to do with the Highlands. It's, it's a coalition of two counties, I think. And they were like, you know, we do need help. Maybe the magazine can do that for us. And, you know, we sent them a proposal and from there we arranged the trip. We stayed um, with a fellow that owns the pretty much the entire town of Bakova. Uh, which stands for Bath County, Virginia, which is kind of an interesting mm -hmm. fun fact. And the place we stayed at was amazing. You know, pull through driveway. Another pro team member, uh, Ed Hall and Stephanie Hall, they they stayed with us. Um, you know, rolled in there in the evening. You know, just in time for um, cold drink hour. And then we planned our expedition for the next morning. And we fished about a day and a half uh, up there. And and then I've been going prior to that time. I've been going um with with my brother and my son and just trying to figure out the fishing there which it's not it's not it's not easy you think anna's tricky mm -hmm. <laughs> is 200 feet of anna with clear water down lake right um, so and that that's that's kind of a long story of how we 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 put the woods and water spotlight on Moomo. a lot of things came together like that we often work with with um different chambers of commerce is to 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 kind of find out what they'd like to have done down there they don't want any more people down there which is the case in some places mm -hmm. you know you just keep move on to the next place but mm -hmm. uh you know the, the fishing fishing a lot of times is eight months out of the year for a lake community mm -hmm. that's the economy and smart marketing people understand that that's right what kind of area are we talking here on this uh, publication how far are you reaching out in the region okay so the circulation for for just will go to uh right up around the dc line up in like nova um out to up up your way up to winchester um all the way out to um hampton norfolk down to the border of north carolina bugs island um, and then over into the Lynchburg area. I'd like to get even further west because there's some neat places out there. But you know, we we are strong, strongest where we have what we call our regional editors help us with our distribution mm -hmm. and our our um, our account management. So anybody out there listening, you want to join the Woods and Waters team? We would love to have a conversation with you. That's just the logistics to be able to shoot something like that is it crazy because mm -hmm. you think maybe they just show up at the lake one day and then boom and do it. But then you don't think of everything behind the scenes that that you have to go through to make all that happen. Um, and I don't think people really appreciate it when mm -hmm. you just see the article and you think they just showed up, typed it out. Nope, nope. There's a lot more work that goes into that. And I think, yeah, it's one thing we found here and I know you're doing it here. And this is what's kind of the point of this podcast, too, is, is it, we're all searching for that information and knowledge mm -hmm. that can help us find that new place that maybe we don't know about or how we can catch fish in a particular season. Maybe we've struggled before with, but just that information and knowledge, that tip 
you know, that can help us have success on the water. Uh, we're all looking for that and searching for that. And this is, again, obviously a great, great avenue uh, for that. Before we switch gears into the guide service, anything else on Woods and Waters you want to speak to or any other questions? If I may, the next edition, mm -hmm. coming, edition is our annual show special, What's New Edition. It's one of our biggest edition that goes up in pages and it features everything new in bass boats, outboards, electronics, and tackle. And it's mm -hmm. Really a labor of love. It's a lot of information packed in there. Um, it also has a show preview, so you can find out all the dates and the different shows around the region. Start all the way up to the NRA Great Outdoor Show in Harrisburg, PA, which is the biggest outdoor show in the world, which is not really that far from a lot of us. Mm -hmm. uh, right down to the Richmond Fishing Expo, which is coming up Jan in uh, middle of January. So, I would say that if you want to, if you want to have a little edge and, and kind of know what you might be wanting to look for at an outdoor show or mm -hmm. As far as a tackle shop, read the article on the new tackle because we pick out a lot of um, stuff that we know works and then new stuff that's coming from those producers. Like there's a new uh, top water lure coming out called the OG Herring by Cast. I, I have two and they are absolutely amazing. There's not the Evil Eye Fishing is Aero Spook or a, a, a Vixen top water from Reaction Innovation or a Shower Blow, which is a, another top water that a lot of people will use. This thing is even, even better. It has a totally not a mechanical back and forth. It's a totally unpredictable. So that kind of information is what's in the magazine in January. That's good stuff. And then for all of our listeners, all this will be linked in the episode description below. Um, so that you'll be able to find everything that we're talking about there. Um, I have one more question before we switch gears. Um, you run this amazing magazine. You also have a guide service. How do you balance this out where you could be on the water with a client, but then your mind's completely somewhere else about that. Like, how do you generate a team, a business team around you to deal with this? Do you ever step away? Or do you always feel like it's 24 seven, just work, work never stops? Well, I'm in the Erkanane Valley and uh, I actually took a nap today. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't think I ever eat or sleep, but uh, I did. I do. And uh, that was really nice. Of course, I walked about 10 miles this morning. Grouse and didn't see anything so um no it's it's 24 7 time you, you're you, if you're going to own your own business that's just the way it's going to be and if it's not then okay find something else to do that's okay but if you want to be an entrepreneur and be a you know what we're doing you have to you have to be on most of the time you're thinking constantly now to answer your specific question when i'm guiding i can guide 13 days out of the month okay and i compartmentalize what i do those 13 days are are blessed days they are absolutely amazing the only reason they wouldn't be amazing is that the fish weren't biting very well and you have to do the you know same thing over again over and over and over again and you know it's, it gets rather dull but um they usually are biting you, you figure it out it's like an incredibly mm -hmm. fun puzzle to talk about so no I, I i encapsulate and compartmentalize 13 days of the month to focus on guiding i also also have i also have help and the woods and waters team you know it, the pro team is is being called upon more and more to help um what we're, because it's important to have different voices and honestly you know i am trying to set up a, an amazing youtube channel you know we have a 35 years established brand and we should have done it 10 years ago and we just haven't been able to get that person we're trying to hire someone now it's very difficult you know with young people right now um you know, they want guaranteed money and guess what when you start out it's based on incentives you know mm. you got you just can't start throwing money at you so anybody interested in that um p potential opportunity i would encourage them to 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 reach us too awesome that that's fantastic um i, I guess my last thing this will be a nice little segue question is, is there a lot of synergy between your your guiding service and woods and water in the business side when it comes to advertiser sponsors and things of that ilk I think there is, Tom, because very, I mean, everybody wants something for free. Everyone wants to say they're sponsored by somebody, you know, honestly, mm -hmm. <laughs> but very few people actually can produce the results that companies want. And you have to tread a very fine ethical line. You don't say, I'll do this if you give me that. That's, mm -hmm. that's not right. What you can say is that let's, let's form a marketing relationship where I will use these products and I will tell people about them mm. and I will be, them. and, you know, I'm not going to, 
have a marketing relationship with products that are not up to the standard in which, you know, we'd want to talk about. And furthermore, if we ever did that and made that mistake, we don't talk about it. And we just say to them, this isn't going to work out. And that has happened so very rarely because most of the time when we affiliate with somebody, it, it works well. So there is synergy. Yes. When we're out in the water, we have the unique ability to show you, your listeners and, and, and our readers, something that they, they might be interested in. And, and that product, in turn, is something they might purchase. So again, a smart marketing relationship understands that ability. And that's important for kids to know if they want to get in the fishing industry, Absolutely. the business, the marketing side. It's not just give me, give me free stuff. Yeah, that is the other cool thing. And it's, and it's kind of interesting to hear your story about Woods and Waters and how you, you know, wanted to do this in mm -hmm. the right place at right time. And it, But in saying that, too, like you said, you were eight years working before you were in a position to be able to purchase the magazine and go on from there. So there's definitely a lot of work ethic that has to go into that uh, to get there on Lake Anna guide. Uh, talk a little bit about your service there. And what is, what is the, um, what is the biggest species of fish targeted or, you know, when your guide service, what, what do you seem to be guiding the most of or for? Sure. So just to give you a real quick perspective, I saved a lot of money guiding in eight years and that's how I was able to buy the magazine. Right. So gotcha. yeah, that one helped the other. Gotcha. So all part of the, part of the plan. Um, McCotter's Lake and a guide service is, you know, I stopped counting at 20 cause I was like, Oh my gosh, I've been this for 20 years. Well, started when I was 23. Um, I'm 53 now. So I've been doing it a long time. Nobody's been doing it longer. And it's, you know, the, the, the goal was to focus on one place. You know, I could, I could guide, a number of places. I could be a traveling guide, but my home is Lake Anna. We live at Lake Anna. And, you know, we, we do a lot of, um, we're involved in a lot of um, local activities, uh, a lot of boards. We've done some fish structure enhancement projects over the years. Um, so it, it is our life. Lake Anna is our life. And the guide service is not just me. It's five other associates and they are good men. And I, I over the years, I've had, you know, some some good men. One one in particular, I remember, passed away tragically. I've had some that weren't so good that I had to say this isn't going to work out. But the men I have now on the McCotter's Lake and a Guy Service team are are fantastic, really good people, and that that really makes me feel like we're accomplishing something. Because when you have good people on your team, then your name, when they fish with other people, when we fish with a lot of people. And, and they come back and they say, hey, man, I really like fishing with Howard. He was really nice. You know, we caught a bunch of fish, but me and my son will remember it because Howard was so fun and relaxed, mm -hmm. you know, never yelled at us, and never fussed at us. And that's the kind of experience that we want. Safety is number one with, with any guiding, you know, your client safety. All right. Then you want to be able to teach them something. And then hopefully you're going to catch some fish along the way. It's always different. You know, what I do with a new client is, is I will take them to a spot, the first spot. And within like maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'll know what I have. I'll know, you know, if I'm going to be doing um, a trip where I'm working very closely with a young person to keep their attention focused on the task of, you know, learning and catching fish. And sometimes it's just going to be learning. Maybe I'm not going to be catching fish for the young person, but you know, we'll maybe have some minnows on a trip like that and make sure that they have the opportunity to catch a crappie or that I have two seasoned anglers, tournament anglers. You know, if I have that kind of person, then the trip's completely different. You're just, you're looking at spots and patterns. They're not so much concerned about catching fish, but you know, I, I fish with all kinds of people and that's part of the joy of guiding. If you don't like people, it's not a good match for you because you're going to be in a boat, a 21 foot boat <laughs> for about five to, five to eight hours, depending on the trip. And um, you need to be able to relate to them on their level. You need to mm -hmm. listen and observe and help them be successful. Yeah, that, that, that is, you have to be a people person to be able to communicate. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is so important with this. And when you're talking about the 20 foot boat, uh, what, what kind of boat do you personally run? Well, Jared, I did not answer the one question for you, and I apologize for that. Oh, you're Back to you, Tom. I would say that the number one thing we're guiding for mostly would be largemouth bass. And we have striper, a lot of interest in wiper, 
it's all seasonal, a lot of wiper right now. And then in the spring and in the fall, we go back, we do a lot of crappie fishing. I got out of a 21 and a half foot tracker grizzly, <laughs> which is a very boat. I've had five of them now, I think. And before that, I had 13 of really cool nitro bass boats. Um, before that, they were Procraft. It's all the same company, Marine, uh, White River Marine. And, you know, I, I had every color I ever worn. I picked the colors. And then you'd have uh, about a year or two years to sell them, which I do. I still sell my boats every two years. And, you know, selling a used boat right now, pretty good. You know, but it's not always been that way. Mm-hmm. But a uh, used boat, like the last one I sold, my 21-foot Grizzly with, you know, full Hummingbird electronics and the best trolling motor money can buy, a Minn Kota uh, Altera that stows and deploys by itself. Um, that, that went pretty fast. You know, I, I run a 115 on, 115 four-stroke. And it runs about 42 miles an hour. So my days of 76 miles an hour are are long in the past. That that it's a center. Is it a center console based on these images I'm looking at? Is it center? That's got to be great for guiding. Then when you're dealing with you don't know a slew of clients like you said to be able to have full access to to move around the boat. I tell you what, it it, it works very well for us. It's extremely wide. It's one of the widest boats out there. It's got a front deck and a back deck. The front deck has three seat positions abreast so i can have three grown men casting hmm. shoulder to shoulder in the front if they want to um and then you can get i mean you know people in the back we don't take any more than four in my boat period it's just you know you don't want to be too tight in there but uh if the boat gets dirty we power wash it it doesn't have carpet in it you know from all the the um you know when, when you catch a lot of fish in a guide boat it gets gross mm-hmm. <laughs> fish you know, go to the bathroom in the boat or somebody drops a coffee, whatever, you know, it's just, you know, I can either it, blood, <laughs> I blot it or we, we power wash it and the boat looks good as new. So if, if anyone's interested in a really neat boat, I, I would encourage them to look into that boat. It's, it's been a really good transition for me. Yeah, that thing looks awesome. Did you, did you have a how is uh, how is the lake? And you, you've got had so many years of experience on the lake and you talked about being on different boards. How, how is the is Lake Anna currently today? Hey, Jared, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, Lakin is busier than it has ever been. I have been here long enough to see a boom and bust three times. And this current boom is bigger than the one that went on in 2006, 2007, before it all blew up. You know, you go into a creek or a cove and there's three or four houses being built. And these are million dollar houses. The truly rich have found Lake Anna. So we're changing a lot. You know, you've got a lot of Northern Virginia that's come to Lake Anna. And we're... I think in the in the near future we're going to be really struggling with with keeping our our rusticity <laughs> um, because you know you've got a food line you've got a liquor store you've got you know beer caves you've got you know you've got a lot of things that um, you would find in the city because you have more people that are coming and want that kind of thing and that's not a bad thing you know you cannot fight progress I tell my kids and people I'm close to that. Uh, change is the one thing you're guaranteed in life so don't fight it just roll with it and that's what we do we just try to make sure everybody knows three words on lake time when you come here don't forget it (laughs) you didn't come here for the hustle and bustle of what you're leaving you came here for some lake time so get on lake time and things will be fine as far as the fishing um i'm constantly amazed at how well the fishing holds up because the past two years in particular, the fishing pressure has increased. As we know, everything outdoors has increased with um, you know, the, the return to the woods and the waters with the COVID effect and people you know, working out of their home. There's a ton of people that live in these lake houses now that nobody ever used to live in. And you know, mm-hmm. they're not living, you know, working on their, uh, you know, remotely, they're, they're, they're being rented. So the crappy fishing is, is if you have, you have poor, fair, good, and excellent, crappy fishing is good, you know? Um, Bass fishing is good. It keeps keeps holding up. And we got some Florida strains that were stocked this past year. Uh, Department of Wildlife and Resources realized that we're not producing any 10-pound bass. Mm. You know, the genes just aren't there. So they, they're going to they freshen them up with some F1N1 crosses. Um, striper mm. fishing is not as good as it has been in the past. There's, in my mind, in, in my humble opinion, there's too much pressure um and the lake is warming up and then furthermore i think two year classes were 
did not take. You know, they stock the lake with stripers each year. They do not reproduce naturally. So two years did not take. So right now we're not seeing a lot of like 20 to 22 inch fish. Um, you see a lot smaller than that, a lot. And then you have some that are bigger than that, but it's tricky. Well, you see a lot of wiper. The wiper have, have done very well. Like the original um, year class of wipers, it may have been 2015, I think, when they stocked them originally. It could be a little bit later. Um, but they had to wait three years after that to, to stock again to make sure they didn't escape over the dam. And they didn't, so they're stocking them again. But those original year class fish, those wipers are approaching 12 to 13 pounds now. Wow. I think wow. the, guys could look it up. I think it's in Clater. And I think it's about, it might be 15 and change, six, right at 16. Hmm. So we're hoping that, you know, we could produce this, um, a state record wiper here, you know, soon. I think it could happen. Um, those are your big your big species. There's a, there's a lot of people that like to white perch fish. You know, there, there's plenty of those. Mm -hmm. the, getting a big one is, is the challenge. But that's pretty much what we fish for. And we, we, do a, we do a Grand Slam trip, which is a uh, largemouth. Striped bass, wiper, and a crappie. If you catch all four, you got a grand slam. Very cool. That's not like a cool challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I did. A, I have a question. So earlier on, you talked about like in a good fishing community, they, they try to market to it. Um, you know, eight to twelve months out of the year. With this this evolution that we're seeing with Lake Anna, where you have DC moving in and, and all these people, and that you still have this fishing community. What type of friction is there around Lake Anna of supporting the outdoors, the, the fishing people like yourself compared to all this money, these new people coming in? Is there a lot of friction there b between these two different sets uh, of individuals? Not as much as you think. Here's a good example of that. Hydrilla, in a word. <laughs> Hydrilla, Lake Anna, in a particular, one particular creek, it, it has a presence. There's little, you know, pop-ups here and there and uh, hydro is a, is a very controversial subject it's a submerged aquatic vegetation it's um exotic and wherever it grows it tends to grow kind of out of control but when it does grow it's a fish concentrator mm -hmm. or it um it, it cleans the water of excessive nutrients because it uses those nutrients and grows so for example if you have excessive algae then hydro is actually a good thing to clean the water or if you have excessive sedimentary runoff, um, it is a good thing. So, you know, on Lake Anna, we, we, we do have a little excessive amount of algae and we do from time to time have some sediment. We've got some, um, they built a golf course recently and one of the, one of the creek arms and, and they, they did some uh, clear cutting and that, that in particular is where some of that hydro goes. So you have some, some landowners, Tom, that when they see hydro, you know, they, they go nuts because they don't understand the balance of the ecosystem. It's, you know, yes. if you build mm -hmm. back of a creek that was at one point basically a, uh, I hate to say it, a swamp with lily pads, but the lily pads are gone now. Um, and then hydro grows up. You have built a house in an area where you get a better deal for your lot, right? Because it's not on a main lake. So you're going to get maybe some shallower water. You're going to get some some weeds that would grow, not only some natural weeds, but you might get some hydro. So we do have a little friction with that, but there's a board called the Lake Inn Advisory Committee that is intended to advise the counties on user group uh, concerns, call them shareholders, fancy term for it. And, you know, the fishermen are represented, the homeowners are represented, and usually we get a pretty good compromise, like the hydrilla, we um, we would spot treat it with chemicals, safe safe approved chemicals by the Dominion and the EPA and the Department of Wildlife Resources, so that we wouldn't wipe it out by using grass carp, which are a terrible thing. We used those many many years ago and destroyed the ecosystem for almost thirty years, wow. and <clears throat> so we use the, uh, the spot treatment with chemicals, herbicidal herbicidal uh, chemicals. So there's some, but it's not it's not terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because I mean, one of the lakes I grew up on as a kid had tons of vegetation in it and mm -hmm. it produced all the time. Cedars Lake in Percival. And then as soon as the, the, the big housing development came in and they, they sprayed for it, it killed it. And 
I'm, I, there has to be re-education at some mm -hmm. point to teach people that it's not necessarily a weed, it's part of the environment. And if mm -hmm. you have a, one tree in the middle of a forest that's not native, you don't firebomb the whole forest to get rid of it because it, it doesn't help anything. Um, and, and that is so hard when you have people coming into an ecosystem that we hunt or we fish in. And it's like, okay, yep, yeah, you don't completely understand why this is mm -hmm. here. And it's needed to create a healthy ecosystem mm. that we can all enjoy. And it's not a pool, but I'm glad you brought that hot topic up because I'll get heated on the whole yeah, thing I mean, about vegetation. And like you said, education is important. And I don't think sometimes we're, because it's funny because I think, you know, outdoorsmen, sometimes we're just, we're kind of, uh, we want to be on the water and in the woods. And we're kind of like, we're, we don't necessarily, or we're not always outspoken. Mm -hmm. We're not always going to tell you what's on our mind. And so we kind of mind our own business and we kind of like fishing and, hunting and so when these topics come up though it's it's finding the right balance yeah and like you said the ecosystem that is so important and just ha having an understanding and if you don't understand you know research it um you know with depth too like you were saying it obviously a shallow area uh it's not gonna it's not like some of the lakes down in florida where you're only at at 10 or 12 foot you know where it could totally choke out mm -hmm. a, a body of water lake in and a lot of our lakes around here because we're so mountainous have a lot of depth to it so in a lot of cases, you may only see, you know, 15 to 30% uh, where it could even grow in the yeah. lake because of sheer depth. And so, so I think it is important to, to get that out there and, mm -hmm. and talk to it and, and try to find a balance between the outdoor users as well. Find that compromise, uh, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, but one thing I had in my notes that I want to talk about would, um, an, I guess, another invasive would be like the blueback heron. Um, and I, and so some people say they, they are in there. Some people say they're not in there. Um, how has that affected the fish behavior in Lake Anna? And how has that, has that changed it in a good way? Has that opened up more area for the fish to be like, like if you look at Lake Murray in the South Carolinas, where not, they're not necessarily always against the bank. So now it's almost like you have more volume of water that can hold a greater, um, abundance per per acre of fish and so has that actually been a blessing in disguise to have them in there or am i wrong or what what are your thoughts so um blueback hearing are in the lake they were stocked i can't remember exactly one but i think maybe around 86 and they have been in my mind they've been good for lake anna now herring changes lakes or herring change lakes because they um they tend to be open water fish they're pelagic fish so they would create schools of bass and striper and, and now wiper that would just roam around over humps or in open water not on structure so a lot of anglers would have to reset like bugs island is, is slowly becoming partially a uh, a herring lake bugs island as in like uh, kerr reservoir and you know some of the old timers are like well if i can't pitch a jig to the willow bush i don't want to go fishing and you know if you go down to nut bush you know, there's going to be a lot of herring down there in that massive creek, which is as big as Lake Anna. And unless you fish offshore, you may not do as well. But, you know, that's you just have to adjust with with the way lakes uh, change over the years because they do. We have blueback here and we have threadfin shed and we have gizzard shed. We have a massive winter kill last year. It was very cold in February when we were dropping brush. Um, we were crunching herring and mostly threadfin, but some herring were dying, too. And that really reset things here because what, what happens is hardly any bait. And then uh, those that survived were extremely cold water hardy. So you, you reset, you know, the, the traits that are passed on, those that survived bred. So you have like a billion tiny little, you know, one, one half inch thread fins in the lake now. And I don't think the herring have really even recovered yet. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Hmm. I would say that would be a very big change for, for our lake is there's not as many herring in here consequently what you're seeing is a lot of skinny fish mm -hmm. you know because you know if you're if you're fishing the bait plug of the pamunkey or the north anna you're not gonna catch many fish because there's you know that's where all the thread fin are and they're eating real things but if you get on the edges of it or or other places where there's fish that are not as much bait you can you're gonna catch a lot more fish um on lures as well how long does it take the ecosystem to to adjust to that? So if you have a major, like if they're primary blueback and you have this big kill, how long does it take the predators to reset? Is it instantaneous for those patterns to, to occur or are they still unfolding? Good question. You know, look, it's guiding is like putting together a puzzle, a new puzzle every single day. <laughs> I think you figured out the puzzle. It's all changed. 
Some days you find just the corners or a portion of the side. Some days you fill it in. By the end of my 13 days, by day like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I should be filling, filling in the entire puzzle. Now, overall, big picture, the, the annual puzzle, things, a lot of things have changed this year. Um, I, I would say that uh, fishing has changed this year more than I've seen a change in a long time. But that's not necessarily bad. We've had incredibly good run of fishing at the lake, good, consistent fishing. The biologist, John Odenkirk, is, is very proud of that, and he should be. We've had, a, we've had, you know, very fortunate, nothing major, bad happens. You know, if you get a, you get a winter kill, it should take probably a year or two at most to get everything back. So we saw uh, what about two weeks ago came across. I, I don't know if it was the winter series, but anyway, what about a 24 pound bag? I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah. Uh, came out of Lake yeah. Anna. Yeah. Maybe Preston and Phil, I can't mm -hmm. remember Rob and, 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 and Bobby Fincham. Yeah. I mean, so 24 you... pounds of, I mean, that's, that's, that's anywhere you go, Potomac oh, anywhere. Yeah. That's comp I mean, that's solid. And then when the F1 got uh, to, when the, bleh, backing up a little bit, when the F1 got introduced to Lake Anna, was that pressure from the community to put them in there? Like, how did that all get about to where you were able to, to make yeah. that happen? Tom, that's a whole nother, no whole nother episode, my friend. I can tell you, <laughs> you in Bass Anglers of Virginia. I would love to tell you all about that. That's how we got the Chickahominy restocked. I was a ground floor on that with Lou Dave and Bruce Lee. And then uh, that, that is a, incredibly good story um that we should never forget and it addresses your question so okay. uh you know the the dwr they're they're great okay but that's a bureaucratic bureaucratic organization mm -hmm. work in that organization there's different ways of doing things than you would be doing in in you know free in, in private enterprise so we can we can you know communicate with our biologists and i have a great great channel of communication with uh mr odenkirk he's, he's awesome been great for the lake and he's you know on my phone i can text him i can get information tell him stuff and, and and i can suggest things to him but he is the man that will make the decisions about lake anna not us so you know we can complain but if the science doesn't support it, it it's not going to happen or you know, he's going to look into it and see if maybe the science is not seeing something. So to answer your question about the F1N1, I think that there was some money that became available and it's an interesting experiment. And if you look at um, all around the state, there's a guy who's in charge of largemouth bass fisheries above John. And they, they I think they put him in, they're putting him in the Chicago still smith mountain got some which is say, i'd heard smith mountain uh, I'd, I'd read something on yeah. that where like you said state was not for it but they raised some funds they had a guy that was able to ante up some money they put it in they put put it in mm -hmm. and so and i think when you see a trial like that and it and it works and it's effective then you know it's kind of like well okay it works and i mean clearly it worked i mean look at the chickahominy i mean bass masters go there every yes. year for the last like 200 years but the weights jumped because of the introduce mm -hmm. of that species so i'm excited to see what like anna will be like yeah let's do another podcast on the whole chicken story <laughs> absolutely yeah, that's a great story and it, it definitely was it had collapsed when by the time we got to it with the, this restocking they you know they restocked in the rappahannock due to angler pressure and it totally failed they don't work in the rappahannock river the tidal mm -hmm. rap so uh there are some success stories um about it but um we'll see anna should work you know they should just, uh, you know, grow like giant watermelons. We'll, we'll see big mailboxes, you know, Florida strain, big headed fish, long fish. We'll see. We hope so anyway, right? Let's, anyway. Uh, let's transition into, um, you know, I think a lot of our listeners are going to be either weekend anglers mm -hmm. uh, or tournament guys. We have a lot of, a lot of different tournament trails out there. Um, and a lot of guys, because Lake Anna is, it is our closest big lake. Um, yeah. And so we have a lot of guys that are, you're frequenting Lake Anna year round. And so if you can, um, what, what would your, some of your tips, uh, recommendations be, maybe let's look at winter right now, since we're in the winter from now until spring, what, uh, what should be guys be considering, uh, if they go, go to make a trip to Lake Anna to fish. Okay. So I'm going to give you a, just a little, a slight yellow light here. I think my battery on my, um, on my device is, is starting to tire, but okay. I'm going to keep rolling. 
And um, typical winter patterns on the lake um, <laughs> are based upon length of day and temperature. Right now, Mid Lake is 50 degrees, guys. That wow. is weird. Wow, December, weird. December, 50 degrees. I, I haven't seen that long. Time. In fact, I may have never, never seen that. Hot side is, is like 70 almost everywhere. Wow. Uh, waste heat treatment facility. Um, mm. So patterns, uh, one of the hottest patterns right now has been um, flutter spooning. We've adapted flutter spooning from Tennessee. We don't use the eight inch nickel spoons. We use a um, Captain Max, uh, half ounce, three quarter ounce, chartreuse on chartreuse uh, flutter spoon. And we'll, we'll obviously, you know, if you've got a live scope, that's great. Um, side imaging is is good too if you know how to use your side imaging um, because you can see where the fish are and you can cast to them flutter spooning is better when fish are kind of in the water column like scraper and wiper because you're going to flutter down to them you're going to lift and you're going to drop you're going to reel on the drop you're going to lift and then you're going to reel on the drop so if you graft it it's like an up it's like v's up down up down and they always um, almost always 99.5 percent of the time they're going to hit on the drop so you have to reel on the drop if you have a slack line on the drop you don't get the fish because you don't you, you there's no way to, to hook them you know it's just like oh I, I think i had one but my line was slack so i don't really know so it, it's a very rhythmic you know pulsing up and down of the rod and I've talked to a lot of people last year and then this year, because last year I really got into it. And that's, that's a whole other podcast, <laughs> Flutter Spooning, how we figured out how to do it here based upon what they do in Tennessee, which does not work, but you got to use a smaller spoon and it does work. And then the other way is just straight vertical jigging, all right? And your rod tip should be six inches from the water when the lure's on the bottom. And then you should lift it no more than a foot off the bottom. These guys that are like yanking the rod up, yanking the rod up, you know, <laughs> It, it doesn't work that way it's not about the up it's about the about the flutter so if the fish are within if your depth finder is showing fish within a foot of water a foot of the bottom okay then you don't need to yank it up two to three feet you just six six inches to a foot up off the bottom and you lift it and then you drop it you lift it and you drop it and it's almost like your wrist is it's like you're doing a um you're, you're kind of rolling your wrist with the, with the, with the rod, you know, about a seven foot rod. And, uh, you know, I use, I use Berkeley X nine line attached to a, uh, an eight pound liter of monofilament. I don't use fluorocarbon, um, which may be a surprise to some people, but fluorocarbon to me is, is, it seems like it doesn't, it's a little brittle in that case. Mm. And, and we're going to catch, you know, a six pound bass every now and then we're going to get striper. We're going to catch wiper. You might even catch a catfish um i've got crappy when you get a little close to something deep down there uh structure wise and um let's see what else white perch oh yeah let's not forget about them <laughs> you catch a ton of white perch that way the other pattern that most of these guys that are bass fishing in these tournaments are catching them on is jerk baits um early in the winter you can crank bait rocks up in the upper tributaries the north end of the monkey monkey having better rocks every turn in the monkey above hunter's landing is a, is a channel bend with rocks on it so that's that's probably what what caught most of those fish and now though you should be experiencing a very good suspending jerk bait bite as the water gets down into the 40s and you would be fishing those around main lake points power plant lakes bass want vertical structure and that means they can go down and up very quickly without moving very far so look at your your gimco topographical map or whatever map nabco or lake Lake Master Maps, whatever you're using, we'll answer Humminbird, and look for those very tightly packed um, topographical lines that show deep water, you know, right next to shallow water. Those would be where you're going to start with your suspending jerk baits. Great tips. For, for the vertical jigging, uh, this is Thomas, by the way, uh, for, for the vertical jigging, are you using like a, a Kevin Van Dam triple grip hook? Or are you using a, a boring old round bin treble hook? Uh, is there anything specific that you're doing with that during the winter time versus the summer? Or is it just the same no, no matter what the water temperature is time of year? So vertical jigging, we do a little bit in the summer when uh, like June, July, when the, when the stripers and the wipers go deep. But it's, it's mostly a, um, a wintertime pattern. Um, but, but they're very similar. When bait goes deep, 
that's when you go deep with the spoons. And as far as the hooks, um, the most important thing is thin diameter, strong wire. Mm. We're using you think of a diameter hook, then no matter what kind of hook it is, you're just gonna you're not gonna get penetration. The fish's mouths in particular right now are as fleshy as they're gonna be. You ever caught a wiper? Imagine a smallmouth bass with stripes on it, and you know how their mouths are like a vice grip that you can't open up. It's very much the same thing that they're they're just even stronger if you can imagine that than a smallmouth bass. So you really do need to have some good, strong, thin diamond hooks. I mostly use gamagatsu hooks. If I'm going to replace a hook on a spoon that I, I feel is inferior, it's going to have a gamagatsu on it. That's good stuff. That's, mm-hmm. that's really yeah. good stuff. What about, uh, you know, everybody always breaks the lake down, mid lake, up lake, down lake. If when you go out, is there anything in particular that um, determines where you're going to start on the lake first? Yeah. The, where I caught the fish the day before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't, you don't need to make it more difficult. And fish are, they're not smart. They're instinctual, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, some people, some people say, well, he thinks like a fish and catch a fish in a mud bowl. Maybe, but it's more likely they know something you don't. Mm-hmm. They know a lure that they'll bite. They found a pattern that, they, that they're, they're, they're hooked into, or their buddy showed them something mm-hmm. and they're keeping, again, it's, it's all about the information. People who do really well in a fishing tournament or just, you know, recreational level, it's generally because they found something that you don't know. So you don't off, you don't need to look at yourself and say, I'm a complete failure because I can't, you know, catch fish like them. You just need to find the nugget of information that they know you don't know or find something out on your own. And uh, and you can be the, the keeper of the secret. But, um, yeah, I would say that Mid Lake has been the place to fish on Lake Anna for in the past four or five years it's just that's the way it's become up late not as good as it once was you can still catch some fish up there you know all those acres and acres of willow grass which is spread throughout the lake that started up late um and and you know, lake has its moments it's just more of a wide open area if we ever you know if someone ever put spotted bass in the lake god forbid john if you're listening to this i would <laughs> never do if somebody ever did they would they would probably find down lake a very nice place to live and and much like gaston they'd probably thrive but down lake has plenty of largemouth bass in it too and it's it's more herring based so if you find out where the herring are down lake you'll do really well in fact if you find out where the herring are anywhere you're going to do the best and mid lake is usually the herring spawn Mm -hmm. so the one of the big secrets to these big huge like may and june limits of bass is is finding out where the herring are Hmm. that's good stuff that's good stuff that is good to know since uh since your power is uh is fading a little bit did you want to switch to the richmond expo yeah if we want to uh (laughs) before richmond's coming up and uh you know obviously you're you're a big part of that and uh you have a booth set up and then you spend some time on the the bass tank uh highlighting different lures um uh what can folks now we're looking at january 21st through the 23rd uh meadow event park in doswell virginia uh we didn't have it last year uh because of covid um so we're back at it again this year what could uh what would folks what should folks be looking forward to at this year's richmond fish fishing expo uh boats buddies and bass that's pretty much what we like to say about that show the gray family out of north carolina runs a really good show they're they're wonderful people um promoters come in all shapes and sizes and they are the best they set a good standard they do a nice show the facility down there at the um meadow um I think it's called Meadow Event Park, mm-hmm. maybe. That's right, now, State it, Fairgrounds. Uh, yeah, the State Fairgrounds in Doswell is, is a very nice facility. You got a bass tub, which is awesome. You can actually see how lures work on a bass tub. Mm-hmm. I, I have a new product showcase that, you know, all the stuff we write about in the magazine that we can get our hands on, I'll show in the tank, and then we'll go around the show and ask each exhibitor, like Lynn Bell, Fishing Pro Tech. I mean, that guy is like the man when it comes to crazy fast fishing tackle that you've never heard of, but becomes incredibly good and popular. He was the first guy to bring mega bass and rookie craft to Virginia. Hmm. Uh, oh, wow. All of the Interesting. Bell. And he's still doing that six cents. He was the first guy to bring that. I mean, it's just incredible. All the firsts mm-hmm. as he has. So we'll, we'll be putting his stuff on the tank. I mean, anybody who wants me to put something on the tank, we do it. And we, and we fish to catch fish, honestly. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. that's what people they want to see you catch one of those fish and see how a lure works and we have a good time on there you're going to see you know bass boats from many area dealers and the caveat this year is if um if they have boats i know one particular boat dealer 
They don't have any boats. They come in, they sell them. So I don't think mm. they're going to be, but maybe they'll have another one of those, those uh, dealers of that particular brand um, at the show. You know, Skeeter's the hottest selling boat in the country, has been for a couple, three years now. Mm. And uh, it's hard to get them in. You know, people just, mm. you know, buy fast, which is a head scratcher because you can't get a Skeeter for less than $68,000. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, that's probably why aluminum has become popular again. Mm -hmm. It's, um, a, a slightly more affordable um mm. and why used boats are so popular but yeah the shows are a great place to see new tackle um you know i was talking to my son who's a, a sophomore at virginia tech he's like well i gotta come back for that show i was like well aren't you just going back after christmas break and uh he goes yeah but i gotta go back to the show i was like well i'll get the stuff you need you just let me know you know dave's tournament tackle dave farrington's right across from me he'll make all the spinner baits we need we'll pick up the jigs we want you know custom made mm -hmm. he goes no dad I want to walk around the show. I want to just experience it. That's right. Just, coming from a 19 year old, that's music to my ears. Cause yes. all there, you weren't seeing a whole lot of young people at these shows, but now you do with all the high school fishing and the college fishing. Mm -hmm. and he's on the Virginia tech fishing team. So they're, they're, they're going to fuel the, the future of fishing for sure. No, that's exactly right. And what you said is so true. The experience, I can't get it to get that across to people more so that it's yeah. such an intimate, um, it, arena to be able to go up and talk to there's just a wealth of information and knowledge whether you're sitting there listening you know you guys are on the bass tank and uh just picking up little tidbits but also being able to talk to them at the booth mm -hmm. i mean just to pick their brain i mean there's it, it's just that and that's what i love about this industry the as human well interaction the part. human interaction yeah. part and uh and those that are in the fishing industry uh, specifically are great people mm -hmm. um and they they like sharing in the like you said earlier the passion of the outdoors and that's what we all share and to be able to get together um and and talk about that i mean it's, it's uh, i know my cousin always says it's the second christmas might even be the first christmas to him like is the richmond show so we, uh, we're definitely looking forward to it and with that said from the business standpoint of it uh since the virus of unknown origins came into our lives a couple of years ago how has the show how's the show done well how's it how's it come back to life since that that first winter where we had it i i know i think it was was it canceled uh mm -hmm. I believe a, so. was it a year ago um what what does it look like this year shaping up with the vendor side of it the business side of it does, does it feel like um we're going to be able to get back into that human interaction phase again yeah that's a question for less not necessarily for me as the promoter mm -hmm. he would about that i know that uh you know things change with COVID and whatever, you know, just, you know, shows change because of uh, the internet, you know, how many times have you, you know, ordered from online? I mean, mm -hmm. I do some online ordering because I'm a pure fishing angler, but I would much prefer to go to like a Jake's or a green top so, yeah. back, um, or, you know, any of these other shops that, that have these lures because, um, I, you know, I, I prefer to look at them in the package and make sure mm -hmm. I'm good or look at the color or have Lindell pitch me on a lure or, or you know big jake pitched me on a lure it's just it is that that connection with stuff and then you know again at the show you know we'll see this is the first year back we'll see you know how people you know respond to that opportunity i, I tell you if you want to learn how to flutter spoon and from somebody on a tank I'll, I'll show you how to do it you know i'm saying you're not going to get, get that opportunity anywhere else so you know if you don't feel like you're you're safe put a mask on come out to the show that's you right know, yeah, and I'll never forget. I mentioned it before. Larry Nixon, a couple of years back, he was he kind of was talking to the Ned Rig, and probably somewhat before it actually took off again. But you know, and I, and I remember seeing it, and he held it up, and he said, uh, "You know, don't be taking a picture of this and putting it on Facebook because that's how he felt he was still competing with the young bucks out there." But you know, again, that's where I kind of first you know heard it, and then thereafter, just you know, really kind of fell in love with it. But um, tell us, tell our listeners too, those that want to, uh, book a trip with you at Lake Anna for your guide service, where can they find you? Okay. So, uh, McCotters, is our website. You can, you can check everything out there, the trips, the rates, um, some testimonials, a little bit of Lake Anna information, um, some photographs, and then you can meet our guides. And then you can also send us an email there. You can give us a picture. Yeah. You can give us a picture. Um, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody just uh, was chatting with me here off off camera. <laughs> you can you can send us an email or you can um, call us. But I would I would request they do not direct message us. Some people will direct message us on Facebook. And I, I just don't check that enough. And that's just going to be a disappointment for somebody. So just email or call. Old-fashioned phone call is the best way to book a trip with McConnor's Lake and a guide service. Very good. Deal. Good deal. Yeah, Thomas, I tell you, and, and Cece, like I, you had a lot of good information on here today. And I think uh, you mentioned you, there's also opportunities for future podcasts, uh, whether it be this, the, um, the, Chickahominy the Chickahominy stocking story. Stocking story. I'm anxious to hear that. Uh, as well as a lot of other information. So uh, yeah, we we'd love to have you on, on again, sir. And thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to, to be here with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Well, it it's my honor, guys. I, I'm going to be, I'm an avid, I'm going to be an avid listener. And I congratulate you on what you're doing and, you know, hope to work together in the future and maybe there'll be some, some good collaborative efforts. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you and your listeners. Sounds great. Good luck uh, on your grouse hunting trip. <laughs> yeah enjoy the rest of your vacation <laughs> you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will <laughs>